is that the six days of Genesis are treated as a group by themselves, and that isn't a discovery just from the wording, but M Moses, in the closing days of his life, in the closing day of his life, in chapter, I just skip through, chapter 30, verse 7, I believe it is. Uh, no, I must be chapter 30. Pardon me for, I, I uh, did not mark this. Yes, chapter 32, verse 7. Moses is giving his final discussion, chapter 32, verse 7 of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible. And he's discussing and he's saying essentially, if you want to see the fingerprint of God in the world, if you want to see the, the emphasis, the expression of God in the world, he says the following, remember the days of old, consider the years of the many generations. Binu shanot dor vador. Zahor yemot olam, binu shanot dor vador. Remember the days of old, consider the years of the many generations. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7. And the commentators say, what's Moses talking about here? Why does he break the time into two sections? Consider the days of old, the years of the many generations. And the commentators mention why. Because what Moses is saying, in the subtle language, because he, he calls the, he says this entire text is a poem. He uses the word poem, a song. And a poem has a text and a subtext. And he's saying, look inside the text and find the deeper meaning. Consider the days of old, the six days of Genesis, the Sheshet Meibreshit, the six days of creation, the years of the many generations, the time from Adam forward. Moses tells us that if we want to see the fingerprint of God, there are two sources of information. There's a clock that begins here, and it adds up to something less than 6,000 years. I'll just use this number directly, but there could be any number up to 6,000 years, okay? And then there's another clock back here that runs for six days. And that clock is separate from this clock, that there are two clocks in the biblical text, one that runs from the creation up to Adam, and a second clock that runs beyond that. And hence, Moses breaks the calendar in that section. Consider the days of old, the years of the many generations. Subtle statement, but enough to have made the sages thousands of years ago to break the calendar into two parts. Now we have to try to understand why the calendar was broken into two parts. The wording of the text is, is quite exact. And as we go through it, we can try to glean from it, as these ancient commentators did, glean from it information that might not be exactly known. Now, the first text, the sentence opens as follows. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first Hebrew word is breshit. The sound of the letter is a b, like a b. Now, Hebrew we read from right to left. So Hebrew is read in this direction. Okay? The first letter is written like this, a bait. That's the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It means a house. Bait also means by it directly means a house as well, because we are within a house of God. That's why the first letter is a bait. But, but there's a cosmic piece of information. 2,000 years ago, in recording writings that we have till today, the question is asked, why does the Bible begin with a letter that is shaped like this? Remember, we're reading from this direction to this direction. The reason, we're told, is that because this letter is closed on every side and open only in the forward direction, we can never know what preceded the creation. A human can never reach back into a time before the creation. We can study the science afterwards, but from the beginning, on this side of the line, it is forever closed to human observation. We would assume at this side we have spirituality, God, however you want to say that word, but we can never delve into it. We can only know what we have here in our world. And the first letter tells us this. Amazingly, science has come to say the exact same thing. Science in the last 15 years, that's what's so wonderful about, thank God, living in this era now when the, it's like opening up a, a flower and each petal gives more and more beauty till you get to the real core of it. Science has come to discover that the creation of the universe was, was in jargon, a big bang, okay, that there was suddenly this massive amount of energy, and the energy was so powerful that you didn't have atoms and molecules and trees and planets and stars. We just had energy, pure energy, and then the energy bursts out and produces what is essentially called a plasma. A plasma is a soup of energy and subatomic particles, protons, electrons, you know, things that make up the stuff that we're made of, but on the, that you don't see with a microscope even, it's too small for a microscope. But they're just, they're not put together. 
into water molecules, into salt that we have on the table. They're just individual p p particles. And w when the world is like that, and that energy, it's called the plasma, and light cannot transmit through it, and, in and information can't. So what science has told us by telling us that we have what's called a plasma here, a soup of energy, just a literally a soup of energy, it has come to tell us that the universe is opaque. The universe is wrapped in an opaque layer that we can never see through. Never. What's new about that? The Bible told us that 3,400 years ago. It started with the letter bait, which is only open in the forward direction. Of course, I have to turn this around to match... All right. And that's the reason. I want to read you now a quote from a professor, Robert Jastrow. Robert Jastrow is a heavyweight. He's director of the Goddard Institute of Space Studies, NASA. I have the good fortune to work for NASA from time to time. A professor of astronomy and geology at Columbia University. Okay. He's a person deeply involved in the cosmos. Here's how he starts the article. I'm not going to read the whole thing, don't I? When an astronomer writes about God... His colleagues may assume he's either going over the hills or going bonkers, mixed up in his head. In my case, it should be understood from the start that I am an agnostic in religious matters. Okay? It's an agnostic writing. He has no vested interest. An agnostic, a person that says he doesn't know, maybe there is, maybe there isn't a God. Okay, lots of people are like that. Here's the closing of the article. He's talking about the fact that the universe, that physics has discovered that the universe is opaque, that we can never see the beginning. Now we would like to pursue that inquiry further back in time, to the beginning of time, to the actual creation. But the barrier to further progress seems insurmountable. It's not a matter of another year, another decade of work, another measurement, or another theory. At this moment, it seems as though science will never be able to raise the mystery, to raise the curtain on the mystery of creation. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. He's been greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. It takes a really powerful mind, an agnostic, to acknowledge the fact that we got there first. The story has been there all along. You only have to dig within the text. And it's for that reason the text has been kept so very carefully. There are museums now from the Dead Sea Scrolls. I have what's called the Dead Sea Scrolls. I don't know if you've been to see the Dead Sea Scrolls at all. Yes? Uh, it's amazing. Now, these date back to over 2,000 years. Some of them date up to 2,200 years old with, 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 with radioactive dating. The texts are essentially an exact match to the, to the, to the Bible. I mean, it's, it's overwhelming. A few weeks ago, I was so fortunate. I was with a group, and we were privileged to go down in a museum called the Rockefeller Museum into the research labs of the, where the research is done. And they had there a piece of, of, of parchment which had Deuteronomy, the, a text of Deuteronomy written on it. And the text had the Ten Commandments in it, the second telling of the Ten Commandments, about chapter 5, if I remember, of Deuteronomy. And it was the original. It was 2,100 years old, word for word, letter for letter for what we have now. Extraordinary fidelity. But what it means is then you can use this information, like the, the first letter being the ship. You can dig into the text, and there is information in there. And that's what we do now, but basing it only on two sources of information. Modern peer-reviewed science, no make-believe science, modern science that, under, that secular scientists see as, as being valid, because then they have no vested interest in matching the Bible, if they're secular scientists. And then ancient biblical commentary, the text itself, and commentaries that date back 1,000 and 2,000 years. No modern biblical commentary, because modern commentators know the science, even if they only get it from the local newspaper. And there's this unfortunate attempt to bend the Bible to match science, or bend science to match the Bible. Don't need to bend, my friends. What's so amazing is, just as it should be, the Bible and the science fit like a hand in the glove because they're both the product of the same creation. It's not like there are two creations. There's one, and that's what we're seeing. So we have here six days that are separate. Why separate? Again, because there was evening, there was morning. There was evening, there was morning. And then we have 6,000 years of time that flow from Adam. I only want to discuss now the six days. The flow of civilization is amazing. And the fact that we're here in Jerusalem right now is amazing. I mean, it's just, it's just mind-boggling.